Let me ask you, do you think politics is dirty? Well, I think no. My answer Good. is no. Good. Because uh, it's not the politics that is dirty, it's the leaders that are there that make it okay. uh, messy. Is politics dangerous? No, if we, but of course, if we go beyond the limit right. of, of, and misuse the, you know, what, what it means. Is politics uh, difficult? No, it's not. Good. The fact that I'm having a conversation with a political scientist and I'm a medical doctor as a surgeon, it's not difficult. Exactly. You see, for people like us, politics is not a 3D job. But when I talk to many Malaysians, you ask them, they say politics is dirty, dangerous and difficult. I can understand that. But what it means is so subconsciously, we think this is a job that we should outsource to some Nepalese, uh, uh, Indonesians, Vietnamese, who's Bengalis, Bangladeshis, whosoever, mm-hmm. right? But if you have that outlook, you are expecting things to be well to be done perfectly and served to you in a silver platter. It won't happen. Okay. Welcome to Hard Talk, coming to you from Kota Kinabalu in Sabah, in Malaysia. I'm Charles Lee. If this is the first time that you're joining us on this channel, I would invite you to please subscribe, you know, just become part of us during, especially during lunchtime conversations. Um, we are on YouTube at Hard Talk dash Dr. Charles Lee. You can also follow us on uh, Spotify. We are also on Instagram and we are also on LinkedIn. Now, this is my opening statement. We are a fractured nation. As a medical doctor, there are different types of fractures and usually these fractures relate to bone fractures, all right? And they can also have fractures involving the social, political and economic strata of the country. And these are fractures that involve frameworks that matter to all of us. In fact, we live in a fractured world. But there are also geological fractures and they are referred to as fault lines that can result in earthquakes and tsunamis with tragedy and death and destruction as we have recently seen on the 1st of January 2024 in Japan. Now these fault lines are very important for us to understand when it comes to the life of a nation. They are actually ethnic divides of race, religion and political reform, the three R's that matter so much to the life of a nation. And if we leave them unrecognized, they can lead to racial divide and economic disparity and ultimately to a polarized nation. Now the 21st century has a battle and that battle of the 21st century is a battle of the mind. You know, in the words of Albert Einstein, he said insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. The opposite of that is to have a civilized mind, a rational mind that seeks after the soul of a nation. The science behind the politics of a nation is usually left to the leader and the party in control, a leader who reports to the people and not to the party. So to help us make sense of where we are as a nation, I started this series called Corvadis Malaysia which is a Latin phrase that means, where are you going, Malaysia? So important for us to know our direction of where the nation is taking us. In fact, today, all leaders and currently are kind of leaving it to the next generation to carry on where they have left off. But if we have no direction, then what the new young leaders are going to take on and take over will be a sense of aimless pursuit to a destination that is not there. My guest today, and I'm so fortunate to have him with me, is a political scientist, one of Malaysia's top. And most important of all, he's the Deputy Head of Strategy in the Asian Headquarters of UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. His name is Professor Dr. Wong Ching Huat. And there is one word that stood out in his resume that really moved me to invite him to come, and I'm so fortunate that he is visiting Sabah and he will join us today and, and you know that one word is the word solutions because we need solutions today 
to face the multitude of problems that this country is going through. Join me to welcome Dr. Tin Huat to Hard Talk. Thank you. Thank, thank you for you, coming and thank you for giving us your time. And let me say welcome to Sabah. Um, thank you. You know, so this is where we don't often get visitors like yourself. And for me, it's the first time to have a, a someone of such a, of a high esteem. And, uh, you know, I watch you in all the conversations of every time there's an election. And I've always told myself that this is one man I would like to meet. And so thank you for giving us your time. Now, interesting. What's this attire that you're wearing, Chin Huat? This is from uh, Kuala Penyu, from the Tatana people. So uh -huh. I went there for Kamatan a few years ago. I went to a tailor shop and made one set for myself. This cigar is actually from my good friend, uh, YB Wilfred Madiostanga, MP nice. Subtwaran. Yes, yes. I mean, I want to congratulate you. You look real Sabahan. Well, Madius would say that I'm a Sabahan Aspal, Asli Tapi Pausu. <laughs> because I have no link back to Sabah. Yeah. It's just that I like Sabah culture, I like Sabah food, I like Sabah people. I come here whenever I can for work, for pleasure and so on. Nice, yeah. nice. Well done. Yeah. It's like when they come yeah. here with my surname Lee. Yeah. And they expect a Chinese, you see. Yeah. So I always tell them that... Uh, I thought you just have too much of uh, suntan. <laughs> I, I got a better, better answer. I always tell them that the Chinese come in different colours. <laughs> and uh, it's been interesting. I can't run away and I can't rob the bank because there's a Charles Lee, you know. And he's a Salonese guy. Those are, that's where my roots are. Right, From, from right, Sri right. Lanka. Yeah. Jaffna. Uh, from, yeah, my, my, my grand grandparents came in uh, from Jaff, Jaffna. Yeah. Yeah. Those days it was called Sri Salon. Yes, yes, and, yes. Uh, so, so there we are. And so I've been in Sabah for, what, 36 years now? Yeah. Uh, as a plastic surgeon. And so it's very interesting that, you know, you can serve in any capacity as a Malaysian. Mm. Uh, and yet being in Sabah is one of the most beautiful times of my life, actually. Yeah. 36 years here. Um, and I feel very much a, a Malaysian, even though I'm here in Sabah. Mm. So, you know, I, I began this series, Chin Huat. Can I call it Chin Huat? Yes, right? please. I began this series called Kuo Vadis Malaysia, uh, in the Latin phrase of uh, where are you going, Malaysia, uh, with a sense of concern about the direction of this country. Right. And, um, you know, as a doctor, you, you want to know, you know, when someone comes to see you, you want to make sure that they're all nice and healthy and and they're healed from where they're going. But when you look at all the problems in this country and having worked for 40 years mm. in the marketplace as a doctor, mm. uh, it's a concerning trend you know, mm. of where we're going. So mm. I want to ask you, as a political scientist, mm. understanding the science behind politics in this country, um, give us an idea of are we heading to the right direction of true north that this country was founded on? Uh, what would our founding fathers think of? Uh, if you look at the situation today, your take on it. I happen to be a minority on this particular issue. I know many people think that the country has gone the wrong way after, some people think it has gone the wrong way after 2018 uh, with the uh, ouster of Barisan National. Then you have other people who think the country has gone the wrong way after the Sheraton move uh, because PH was overthrown. I think we have gone the right way, uh, but it's not a straightforward way. We're going to see go through this bumpy road. Why do I think so? Is that what we have seen since 2018 is our democratic structure is clearly put to test. We, at the time when Malaya gained independence in 57, Malaysia was formed in 1963, we of course had that democratic heart where we have elections, we have parliaments, and so on. But that doesn't mean that our country had real democratic competition. What we had for most part of our uh, national life before 2018 was soft authoritarianism. You can call that at some point, uh, and certain parts of it even, it, it's just an elect, it's one party state with elections, or electoral one-party state. Right. Right. Uh, the difference between us and, say, countries like China, uh, Vietnam, Cuba, is that they're more honest. They're one party, and they call themselves, they don't pretend to be a democracy. Right. At some point, our system was just merely to preserve the form of democracy when you, 
the essence are not democratic. Right. So what happened after 2018 that when you have uh, that uh, grand old party, Barisan National, or it's called Amno, thrown out, then the system really opened up. The process, of course, started a bit earlier, 10 years before then, 2008, the political tsunami. But eventually what we see is that now, a lot of people expected Malaysia to become a two coalition system, that mm -hmm. two multi ethnic coalitions compete in the middle, so both are moderates and so on. And, uh, but this did not happen after 2018. Right. And before 2018, we have had three attempts to build the second coalition after Barisan National. Uh, in, in sort of like the last two generations' time. The first was Gagasan Rakyat and Angkatan Perpaduan uh, Uma under Tengku Razali in late 80s to mid 90s. The second one was after the Reformasi movement, Barisan Alternative. The third one was Pakatan Rakyat formed after the political tsunami. On 1st right. of April 2008. Now, all these trees disintegrated in their second elections because they could not make any gain. But they didn't make any gain. They didn't make any gain. Parties saw no reason to stay in the middle. Because stay in the middle and be part of a coalition, you have to compromise. Right. You have to uh, mellow your tone, your ideological goal, so it becomes less attractive to your core supporters. Right. And if you, don't, if you are not compensated with a better prospect of winning executive power or at least more seats, why should you do so? Right. Right. So the opposition collapsed. Then you have, uh, after 2015, you have this Baris, uh, sorry, you have Pakatan Harapan, PH. Right. Now when PH won in the three corner in 2018, we passed playing uh, the spoiler unintentionally to our BN more than to PH. Mm -hmm. PN, BN, sorry, BN became the last victim. All right. Why? Because the power was so concentrated, the East Malaysian parties, except PBRS, the one led by uh, now after... Uh, Kurup. Kurup, yes. Yes. Right. Uh, which returned to BN, all others have left. Right. The Sabahan parties were the first to quit. Then you have uh, Sarawak BN, which became GPS. Right. right. And then later, entire Amnu Sabah meltdown to yeah. become Bersatu. Why? Right. Why did they do so? Simply because that the system did not provide incentive for an opposition coalition to survive. Right. So people then see, why should I stick with you? I came to you in the past because you were powerful. Right. Sometimes I may not even have a choice. Right. You basically force me and say, do you want to be with me or you want to be beaten up by me? So I join right. you. Right. But now that you are poor, I don't have to stay. Right. Right? Right. So they move on. So what you saw in the 2000, after 2018, that, that 22 months, we did not see a healthy two-party system because BN was no longer multi ethnic right. BN was basically Amno, Peninsula Amno, and denying, being denied the prospect of coming back on a middle ground, what Amno did very rationally was to team up with PASS. Right. Right. That's pushed the government <clears throat> on the defensive side. Every day have to defend itself that we are not selling up Malays, we're not selling up Islam. Of course, then you have Sheraton move. Now, after Sheraton move is supposed to create, uh, uh, you know, unite most of the Malay parties together. On the peninsula side, you have uh, Basatu, PAS, and Amno together. Okay. Right. Supposed to bring about Malay unity, but it didn't happen. We know that what happened after that, uh, Muhyiddin lasted for only 17 months, and then eventually Ismail took over with an MOU with PH. He had a very uh, stable period of 13 months, but once you have elections, collapse again. Now, many people thought that this are uh, frustrating, but I want to say we really need to look at, we need to count our blessing. 
Let me start Absolutely. with a very, very simple one. Okay. So when we talk about blessings, we'll come back yeah. uh, and go into details because yeah. um, the, the word blessing is sometimes, uh, you know, there are deeper meanings to it. Sure. And, and I want to take you further into that. So yeah. we'll come back. Yeah. what what you're saying is that the direction, Kualbadis Malaysia, to you now, currently, that we are in the right direction. Yes. We are in the right directions because political elites are now no longer have full control. Right. So they cannot make plan to maximize their gain. In other words, majoritarianism is no longer in full force. Right. People cannot think that uh, we don't take all and their lucks are always good and so on. They have to moderate their actions, right. their thoughts, and that helped to de-escalate tensions in our society, even though that has not come full force yet. Right, right. Um, you know, there's a crisis of identity in this country today. Mm. Um, we know the direction. You've given an overview of where we have been moving and where we are today. But when we come down to the person itself, the citizen, mm. be in Sabah, Sarawak, Labuan or Malaya, mm. what is it to you to be a Malaysian? I think that uh, there are two meanings of Malaysia. One is that it's a good country that every citizen has a chance to actualize his or her potential. Now, that country can be anywhere. The second, so it's generic. The second right. part, of course, is very specific. You're talking about a country in between uh, the Malacca Street and uh, the Sulawesi Sulawesi Sea and Sulu Sea, right, in between, separated by South China Sea. Right, right. Now, people often like to stress the second part, how special we are. I'm all with that. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm wearing this. Uh, often people like to talk about Malaysia as if that this is just an extension of Malaysia. Uh, I'm very glad that my Tatana friend introduced me to this costume. And of course, this is not the only Saban costume I have. Okay. I have more. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're more Sabahan than me, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I, I want to highlight this because if you're talking about identity in a specific sense, then I am blessed to be in a country uh, with so much diversity in all counts. Now, but if we go back to the generic sense, what makes a good country? I would say a country that allows us to be the best of ourselves, to provide and enabling environment. Mm. And are we there yet? Certainly not. not. But are we completely not, not there? Definitely also not. We are somewhere, but we can always be better. Right. And I'm, that's the reason why I'm not complaining. And I don't feel that uh, this country is hopeless and so on. Look at the whole world. How many countries you go in and say it fits everything for me? No. The best country is the one that you have to work it out to suit your taste. In that process, you have to engage with people, you have to push, you have to make compromises. All these things require us to take ownership. Right. But a lot of Malaysians feel uh, frustrated, uh, disappointed, disheartened, and so on, because deep down, we have this sense of helplessness before politics. Yes. People like to think that politics is... Let me ask you. Do you think politics is dirty? Well, I think no. My answer Good. is no. Because uh, it's not the politics that is dirty. It's the leaders that are there that make it okay. uh, messy. Is politics dangerous? No. We, but of course, if we go beyond the limit right. of, of, and misuse the, you know, what, what it means. Is politics uh, difficult? No, it's not. Good. The you fact see, that I'm having a conversation with a political scientist and I'm a medical doctor as a surgeon, it's not difficult. Exactly. You see, for people like us, politics is not a 3D job. But when I talk to many Malaysians, you ask them, they say politics is dirty, dangerous, and difficult. I can understand that. But what it means also subconsciously, we think this is a job that we should outsource to some Nepalis, uh, uh, Indonesians, Vietnamese, who's Bengalis, 
Bangladeshis whatsoever, mm -hmm. right? But if you have that outlook, you are expecting things to be well to be done perfectly and served to you in a silver platter. It won't happen. Okay. Well, it was a well, point taken, and uh, and and I love your your thinking process here. Um, but let me ask you, Chin Wai, Malaysia's political polarization. Yeah. You mentioned the word diversity. Mm. Uh, is diversity the root cause? No, I'm not Mahathir. So if you think from one perspective, I'm not Mahathir. Okay. <laughs> yeah. If you think right. from one perspective that a country can only uh, can only be at peace if everyone looks the same then you can blame that on diversity. But look at comparative differences. There are countries that are very peaceful despite being diverse. Simple example, Switzerland. Right. Right. Even Ireland, look at it that until, until very recently, Ireland was so peaceful despite welcoming so many immigrants who are not even Europeans. Mm. But there are also countries that are less diverse, but have been fighting among themselves throughout. Right. You don't even look, have to look far. Look at ancient China. How many people killed, got, get, got killed because of war? And in some parts, involving foreigners, but other parts completely just civil war, right? So it go back to the questions about what actually drives us into conflict. Polarization, of course, is a preparatory step before a full-scale war and so on. Right, right. right. But even let's say, now look back at diversity. I want to get that attention to this. Let's think about Northern Ireland. If we put, let's say you go back to the 70s when you have the years of the trouble, you have one Catholic, one Protestant, one Hindu, one Muslim. You put them in the room. Who do you think most likely would fight? Catholic and Protestant, right? Definitely. But both are Christian. Right. As you compare that, you want to rank their differences, you would say probably Hindu is the furthest because Hindu believe in is, uh, is polytheist, right? Then you probably have Islam, is Abraham, Abrahamic faith, but it's very different from Christianity. But why don't people fight, like, you know, between all the Abrahamic ones <coughs> against the Hindu or between uh, Christians against the non Christians? Why they would fight? between the Catholics and Protestants. So despite the little differences, it's because of politics, right? right? Because people were given different treatments. It's the, the, the social unrest, the political trouble in Northern Ireland is not theologically, theologically informed. People didn't fight saying, arguing over uh, mm. St. Mary. Right. Not about all those issues. Mm. They fought each other because they were much at stake on how one groups getting treated. Yeah, so ultimately, it's, at the end, is how that particularly uh, how that particular group is treated. Exactly. It's, it's a material interest we are talking about. Right. Right. So if you do not deal with this part, even people who look very similar can start fighting. Sure. If you find a way to deal with it, right. then it wouldn't be. So now it come back to talk about, when we talk about this, it is, I'm, I'm not saying that diversity will never lead to it. But what is important is that how is diversity configured? Mm. Right. In, in social sciences, we have this simple idea about cleavage structure. Yes. You have this fault line. Now, if you have all the fault line cutting across almost the same, then you basically have two big groups. Right. Right. Their interests would be opposed to each other or different from each other. In many cases, would simply be opposed to each other. How can they not fight? Right. This is why a country that, is, that have two bipolar, 
when they have two poles, we call it bipolar, bipolar. Uh, bimodal society, mm -hmm. then uh, they are more prone to conflict. Right. right. But if a cleavages cut across each other, think about, say, India pre Moti. Okay. Before BJP. Right. You, you would have people uh, classify into different categories based on their religion, their language, their caste. Okay. And right. so I may team up with you on language and fight someone else, uh, you know, on, on other things, on, right. on religion or whatsoever. Okay. And the next day I will team up with some other people and then we come back and fight. Okay. So you, you mentioned uh, a word that is very close to my heart, yeah. and that is fault lines yeah. um, and cleavages and divisions. Yeah. Um, and we want to come back to that because uh, that will take us deeper into this whole concept of uh, Malaysia's political polarization. Yes. And I want to take you to the next segment where we will talk about what I feel is a fractured nation. And, and, and it's all because of fault lines yeah. uh, and uh, the three divides that I would love your, your point of view. Thank you. Welcome back to uh, Hard Talk in this series called Kuo Vadis Malaysia. Uh, where are you going, Malaysia? And my guest today is Professor Dr. Wong Shin Huat, who is the Deputy Head of Strategy, UNSDSN Asia, Sunway University in Malaysia. We are talking about Malaysia's political polarization, and the question is, is diversity the root cause? Uh, we were talking about in India. Yeah, uh, pre-Modi. Uh, yeah, pre-Modi. Different, you know, different groups, right? Yeah. Um, how did, I mean, how do you sort of fight with one another there? Isn't that right? Yes, I think, I think you see, if we, comp we, we are looking at cleavage structure, yeah. we are comparing two types of cleavage structure. In the first type, you have all the cleavages almost cut next to each other, very mm -hmm. close to each other. Then you have two main blocks, and they, everyone this side would have different and sometimes directly opposing interests to everyone on that side. So what you're going to have is two a different, crash. Yeah, right, right. But the other kind of structures, as I say, a very diverse society where people can actually deal with it is uh, the differences much easily or more productive or less uh, harmful is that when the cleavages cut across each other. Right. So say today A, B and C team up fight again D, E, F on language line. But tomorrow it may be A, C, uh, A, C, F team up fight against the other three on religious line, right? Mm -hmm. And some other days may be on caste line. All these things are of course not the best because it's based on identity. But you compare the two types, you could definitely tell the conflicts in the second type of society are much manageable. Mm. Because people do not have permanent friends, do not have permanent enemies. Right. So even when they fight, they do not become angel, but when they fight, the circumstance more mellow them, make them more moderate. Right. And this is what we need. But ultimately, what we want to is to think about what drive elections. Now, as long as you have elections, political parties and politicians have to compete on product differentiation. Right? Product. Product well, differentiation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's say, let's say uh, you have many competitors offering the same kind of medical service. Then you want to say that mine is better than my, 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 my peers, my rival, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can attract your patients. Correct. Now, how do politicians compete? Basically, you can look at it in three ways. First is identity. All these questions about ethnicity, religion, language, regions, or lifestyle, things that you can not change or you really do not want to change. And, and it basically just say, let's get our people together and we count the hate to see who has more on this side and that side. So it's not productive and it often can tear society apart. Now the second type is patronage. If I have money, I can buy woods, right? If I control the government and there's no system to stop me using public money to buy woods, I win. But that's, and, and 
patronage may actually moderate group conflicts. Because mm. when you give money to everyone, you probably don't have to be very nasty. Mm. But it's bad on the other way because it causes wastage, mismanagement of resources, and worse, corruption. Absolutely. Right? So yes. we have to move on. Uh, the, the, the right kind of product differentiation that we need for democracy to work is policy differences. Right. It's solutions. So what is solution? Then different parties look at it and say, what's the most pressing problem that we face? Mm. Right. Then what are the solutions we can offer? Right. They compete in identifying problems, mm -hmm. maybe different type of problems, or different aspects of the same problem, then they compete in offering solutions. Okay. Now, when society gets into that, you are at least sorting one thing out over the other, right? right? And, and because they, they can move away from identity and so on, patronage, then the solution is more likely to cover everyone. Yeah. Most of the people, that's how democracy should work. And I see it that Malaysia is moving towards that because after the ending of one coalition predominance by BN, mm -hmm. there is a better chance for parties, uh, that the parties are forced to accept the fact none of them are going to win back that dominance. They have to team up with different parties in government. Yes. Yes. Then when they come to elections in their interaction, they have to think, they have to balance two needs. The first need, what we talk about in election, how do I show that I'm different from my rival? Otherwise, I cannot win votes, product differentiation. Right. But second, after elections, I need to enter negotiation with my rivals to form government, coalition government. Right. So if I'm too harsh, if I call my, my rivals, uh, they are Satan, they should go to hell, these are wicked people, mm. the robbers whatsoever, idiots, after elections, they would not talk to me. Right? right? If I want to talk to them, I want to hug them, my supporters would say, you play up our sentiment. You yeah. cheated me. You right. say this is bad guy, now you want to, yeah. you want to hug him and kiss him, right? right? Now, once politicians get used to all these things, their conduct would be more mellow. Right. And they would have to slowly develop skill on policy differences rather than talking about identity, whose God is more powerful, uh, you know, whose ancestor come here first, whose language is more, has more value. Right. All those questions, all those debates are unproductive. Yeah. It doesn't uh, solve our problem. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, point taken, you know, and I wish that all the political leaders in this country would listen to you uh, and think wisely how we can all be on that same platform of uh, an endpoint that is um, profitable to all. Yeah. To all, you know. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, as a doctor, we talk about human conditions, and mm. today very much you are talking about the national condition mm. of this country. Mm. Um, and I talk about that. I've always said that we are a fractured nation. Mm. Fractured in the sense that there are divisions and lines. You talk about cleavages mm. just now. Um, race, religion, and uh, political reform is one of the three. So we talked about race. Now, how do you equate what you have said to ethnic nationalism? I mean, we recently we had elections in six states, right? Mm. Uh, and you find that there is so much of movement towards this is, you know, uh, us, this is, belongs to us, and, mm. and the fear of losing what you have. Mm. And this is now ending up with segregation, blocks, and all that. Mm. How do you see... Uh, it is natural. The reason being that our society uh, is still so... Different ethnic groups have different life chances. Right? And we have very low trust across community. So very naturally, just based on human nature, we look for people of the same kind to think that they will protect us. Yes. So that's the reason why uh, coalitions like Prekata National is so powerful, popular among the Malays. Mm. Now, and th what you mentioned about six states, this is very important. People talk about the green wave, but there were actually two green waves. The first green wave emerged 
in GE15. At that time, you have a 4.9 million new voters entering the electoral room because of automatic voter registration, mm. AVR, and only 18. Mm. Now, Perikatan National capture around a net 2.6 million. So most of the new voters, majority of the new voters went to them. Right. Most likely. <clears throat> there must have been some draw. Yeah, because, yeah, I mean, because, you know, because basically... people, feel, people feel that uh, they cannot trust UMNO. Yes. Because that is corrupt. They could not trust PH, thinking that PH would lead to non-Malay dominance. Now, that's right. come back to majoritarianism. The system is so majoritarian. We do not believe the ending of a particular type of majoritarianism would be inclusion. We right. think we would only have to choose between Malay nation, Malay no dominance or non-Malay dominance, Chinese dominance, right? Instead of saying Malay dominance to no dominance to inclusion. We don't believe in that. Right. So therefore, you have that in the first wave. Now the second wave, second wave was because UMNO and PH team up to form the unity government. So the three corner fight in GE15 had become a street fight in the state elections. Right. And that's why that you see UMNO performing so badly in the northern states as well as Slango and Penang. Yes, yes. Because for nationalist voters, they cannot bring themselves to vote in UMNO to play second feeder to PH. Right. So it, they, the, the common line is that, oh, because they cannot accept DAP. Let me put it this way. If it's no DAP, is only PKR, they will say, oh, because there's a PKR. The real problem is that UMNO supporters would not, cannot swallow that UMNO become the new MCA. Right. MCA was the number two in the end. Yes. But it would come from basically UMNO support. Yes. Right. Yeah, I, 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 I like your point of view because um, I'm going to take you back to this movement of UMNO and you know, how people moved out and they've gone into PN and all that. And if we go back to the 1968, 69, you know, during the time where I believe has been a rupture in Malaysian society, uh, and the same thinking also that, you know, how they left UMNO mm -hmm. and when and opened up uh, opposition uh, Malay parties more, there was a sudden evolution of all that going on, which weakened UMNO. Until today, you'll find politicians uh, bringing up UMNO uh, at that time, 1969, and as a warning that we can become weak if people move out to other things. So let's come back to that point in the sure. next discussion. Chin Wan, May 1969, um, I was 17 years old. And to me, that is the biggest rupture, uh, the Achilles heel, as I call it, uh, where we show the weakest point of this nation. And we don't want to ever go back to that area unless and until something has gone tra you know, tragically wrong. Yeah. The lessons learned from that, um, you know, there's always this thinking that it was the Chinese that sort of caused this the uprising and all that. What's your take on it as a, as a political scientist? Well, the story that we commonly heard is that uh, the riot was caused by this unease that the Chinese had walked out of the arrangement of power sharing by voting out the alliance government. Right. Now, uh, <clears throat> the reason why we had this impression is that the non-Malay-based opposition party at that time, DAP, Gerakan and PPP increased the seats of their pre forerunning part, forerunner parties from six to twenty-five, so right. four times increase. While PAS only increased its seats from nine to twelve. And so PAS was opposition too. Opposition yeah, too. Yeah. So that looks like that it was actually a shift on the non-Malays, especially Chinese vote. Right. And then with the post-election victory parade and so on, that prepared the ground for the riot. Mm. Now, what people do not know is that if you look at the percentage of vote, the alliance in the peninsula lost 10% of votes in the peninsula to pass. Right. They almost lost zero to the three non-Malay-based parties. 
There were different sets of non-militant state party, 1964 and 69, but you could see them as successing, successful party. Mm. So there's no, if we look at the total, this was a Malay tsunami. tsunami. And you further look at the increase of voters, you probably would say that high chances the Malays that voted against the alliance were young voters, probably because they did not see how independence has improved their livelihood and so on. Mm. So they supported that. Malay votes shifted from alliance to pass. Right. With ex only exception was in Kelantan. Right. In Kelantan, where pass with the state government, votes shifted from pass to AMNA. Oh, okay. Right. So, but overall, you could say this is entry as ravishment vote. But why would it? Why? Why is it that caused so much different? This has to do with first past the post. First past the post allocates allocates seats not based on the total percentage of votes, but based on your where your votes are concentrated. Mm. So in 1964, the non-Malay based party were very split because there was socialist front which was more hard left, pro-Indonesia in the confrontation. Right. Then you have other parties like uh, PAP at that time, uh, United Democratic Party and also PPP that were central left, that pro-Malaysia. So they fought against each other. Mm. Woods are split, right? right? So they did very badly. They only have six seats. Now, in four years time, in yeah, five years time, uh, the Socialist Front disappeared from the scene. And the new parties decided to form a pact. So they learn about this value of unity. Mm. They have one-to-one -one pact. So they put up a, they have a pact, they put up one-to-one -one contest against alliance. They did well. They're good students. They learn from the system. They did well. But they shocked the nation. Right. Pass, on the other hand, because that they have not been so disadvantaged by the system. So even with that in increase of 10% points, they didn't increase much of their seats. Mm. So there was a real shift, and, uh, and, and that, that's surprising, and it's good to know, yeah. Yes, it, what happened if you do not have this riot, the three Malay-based party and PAS may eventually talk about forming a second alliance, then the two-party system could have happened much earlier. Right, right, right. With the riot, all this was gone, right? So, but looking back now, how can we prevent such, such a, a shock? Thing, yeah, shock? Yeah. Because the problem is that humans are, Emotional beings. Right. We cannot assume Very people much to, think, so. to think rational all the time. If something, a shock happened to us, we just respond to it. Right? So to move away, what I would suggest is that we should, we should have party list seats alongside first pass the post. So first pass the post can still give you shock, but party list would give you the outcome based on the real support. Mm -hmm. So in this case, and it also would make sure that you have more party uh, coming to the parliament and so on, that that structure would be different. Now, what are the countries that we know uh, in our neighbourhood that have a system with first past the post and also party list votes? Japan, Taiwan, uh, Thailand. Right. So all these countries, they have a very simple system. You have certain number of seats. Majority of them are in party in constituency like ours. Then. You also, the voters have a second vote to vote for parties. Right. The part then these are different segments of uh, seats. And then the parties will nominate the candidates in the whole list. So if you have ten seats, they can a party can nominate up to ten candidates. Now if the party get twenty percent of seats, it will get at least two seats. Right. Twenty percent of vote you get at least two seats. So it correlates to yes. you know, yes. where so this would actually make the system a little bit more proportional, it reduces the shock. Right. Right. This is a system that we can consider if you want to do it in Malaysia. What we should do is that turn every state into a large constituency. You get extra number of seats than the party can contest. And this would also allow non communal based parties like Muda, based on generations, PSM, based on class, and maybe new parties based on environment, on gender issues whatsoever, come in. They will win maybe one or two seats here and there, but our political conversation will be more diverse. Right. Right. 
and then that sort that's of what, levels the field more, you know, and uh, more participation. Yes, that's what you want. Yes. Um, then the second lesson we can learn is to delegitimize political violence. Right. It is very natural. People like to think that if I am wrong, I have the right to resort to my anger. Now, but that hurts. You see, if a society is ruled by anger, and we think that society has a duty to protect people from getting offended, then the society cannot move ahead. Right. We need to accept that in everywhere, in any society, people always get offended. So we need to deal with how do they get offended, right? In, in some cases, it's just about a matter of debate. You have a debate, and then after that, someone wins, someone loses, no one really needs to get hurt. Yeah, but in Malaysia, I think it's race, right? Yes, but it's, it's not about the race or what. It's about how we deal with it. Correct. So it's, it's a question about how do we deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to accept that there should be room for rationality. Now, Absolutely. Then, uh, for things that are actually causing uh, real harm, especially if they threaten violence, there should be punishment. In between that, what if there are some things that bad taste, but it doesn't warrant a legal ban, then we need to have social sanction. Right. Society need to come out and condemn it. I'll give you a real example. In, 2000, in 2009, uh, I think around July, there was this cowhead protest mm -hmm. in Slang. Uh, there was a new government led by the opposition, Pakatan Rakyat at the time. Then in this particular community, they had an old Hindu temple. The community wanted to relocate this old temple because now surrounded, surrounded by Malay houses. Right. There used to be an estate, now become housing estate. So yeah, very inconveniently, a Hindu temple surrounded by Malay, they want to move it up. They had to move to a mixed neighborhood. But then the, next, the people in the Malay in the, next, the mixed neighborhood protested against it, seeing it as an encroachment in order to put pressure on the government and to inti intimidate the Hindus, they carry a cowhead. So at that time, the idea was to show that if you have political violence, if you have opposition come to power, you're going to have violence. So in some sense, it's to capture the May 13th fear. Yes. Right. What we did was at that time, as civil society, we, we gather NGOs and issue a statement that does not spread the fear. We make it very clear and say, you know, this is, people don't have to worry, society is safe, but also we are condemning it as a case of violence. Now, the language did not put it and say, this is a violence by the Muslim on Hindus. We say, this is an attack on a religion, but when a religion is attacked, all religions are attacked. Right. Okay. And that statement put things in right perspective I was the, one of the drafters of that statement, and I remember getting an email from a Malaysian student group in UK who wrote to us and said, please make sure our name is in, because those cowhead thugs, they don't represent Muslim. I do not want them to represent Muslim. This statement allowed us to make that clear. Right. Now, we need this. So when we do this, then society will be able to move on, Thirdly, very briefly, we need to recognize whatever social uh, political discontent sorted out at the root. With me today is Professor Wong Chin Wat, uh, who is our political scientist guest for our talk today. Um, we are on the topic of Malaysia's political polarization and is this ethnic divide the root cause of what is happening in this country today. The question now is, do we need a professional, moderate, nationalistic party to help foster inter-ethnic harmony in Malaysia and prevent the further erosion of our social cohesion? Well, let's hear what Chin Huat has to say further. So with the current coalition government, AMNO is the second largest uh, party there. Um, can it survive the G16 that's coming up? Possible, but it would not be easy. I'm not make the right choice to join this unity government 
because it has very little overlapping seats with pH, meaning they are not main competitors. In contrast, had Amno joined PN, it would be number three after PASS and Basatu. Right. Uh, it would be confined, it would have to accept that it's going to be playing the third fiddle to these two main rivals. So it make the right decision here. But whether it could survive or not depends on ultimately two things. One, can it carve out a position that is compatible with pH in government at the same time distinctive from pH? It cannot look exactly the same. Right. Because otherwise then it would not be able to expand its words beyond the pH hard core. Right? Mm -hmm. This is product differentiation. Right. But of course, that position cannot be what it held in the past by slamming DAP, slamming PKR, trying to play communal heroes. Yeah. Because if you were to do so, you can win seats. But after that, you can't form government. Hmm. It wouldn't make sense. Both your supporters and peer supporters would not accept it. So that's first part. Now, that requires deep thinking on how this party position itself as a respectable, professional, moderate nationalist party. Now, many Malaysians don't think it's possible. Malaysians who are liberal in leaning, a minority in background, like to think that all ethno-nationalist parties are reactionary. They, they are no good for this country. But the fact here is that we actually need a professional, moderate nationalist party. Right. Because only you have that options, the words wouldn't go directly to PN. The second challenge then is how can UMNO avoid this perception, whether being spelled out or not, that it is the new MCA. Right. Now, what do I mean by new MCA? Yeah, this is the first time I'm uh, enlightened us on this. Thank you. In the old days of Barisan National, MCA was the second largest party. Correct. Would always be given four minister seats in the cabinet. But MCA, no matter how hard it tried, it had a legitimacy problem with the Chinese voters. The Chinese saw MCA as UMNO representative to deal with the Chinese, rather than the Chinese representative to deal with UMNO. Oh, okay. Right. So therefore, um, uh, MCA people find very frustrated. They work very hard. But they get very little votes. Uh, the Chinese felt that we should have, you know, it's right for us to vote for the AP because they really protect Look after the, the Chinese the and so on. Right? Yeah. UMNO is getting into that problem because UMNO is part of the government that allow UMNO to dish out patronage in many ways. That help UMNO to secure some of his support. However, if UMNO cannot strut off that image that this is a new MCA, then Malay nationalist voters would think that even though I like AMNO, I'm going to vote PN because AMNO has lost his soul. Now, the, this actually has been put up by many AMNO politicians, especially those who are not mainstreams, like uh, Isham Jalil. But the way they frame it is like, oh, Malay don't like AMNO working with DAP. To me, that is oversimplified. Right. What I mean is that, let's say you don't have DAP. Let's say DAP merged into PKR. You only have PKR. They would say, because Malays don't like UMNO to work with PKR. Basically, the real problem is UMNO is too weak. Right. Right? So it's, it's not a, a racial kind of problem. No, it, 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 it has is, to it do has... with it, but it's not explicitly because of DAP or whatever. It is it's, it's ethno-nationalistic in the sense that Malay nationalists cannot accept that voting UMNO in for UMNO to be number two. Right. What they want is that if I'm going to vote for UMNO, UMNO then must have a chance, be. must have a chance, not as they have to be immediately number one, mm. UMNO must have a chance to be number one, to work towards number one. Right. right. How can that happen? It can only happen in two ways. One is that UMNO and PH would contest against each other, maybe just in a limited number of seats. So the idea then, UMNO is not a bonsai brand. Hmm. Right, MC was basically this is the seats. These are the seats given to you. You basically just fight here. You win forty seats. That's the most you can do, right? But you know, change the main structure. Amno has to recognize this. 
that the national voters want to feel that they are assured that their interests are protected. But also UMNO need to make sure that it cannot destabilize the government because otherwise, why would PH want it? And UMNO wouldn't want to form a government with PAS and Pesatu. So they become three? Good. Because it would be just like the last government right. under Muhyiddin, right? It's like three brothers going after the same girl. How can they be? How can they be loving to each other? It's a simple right. human nature right. issues, right? So come back to this. So how can they do it? One is actually to have friendly matches with PH. So for example, in the northern states and so on, that PN is so strong. Of course, they have to have single candidate, one to one. Right. Don't split the thing. Don't split the word. You Correct. have no choice. You must work together. Yes. <laughs> because even working together, no guarantee you win. But at least give you some chance. Split right. your words, completely gone. Right. right. But in the South, where places where PH or Amno is strong, at least one of them is so strong that PM wouldn't stand a chance to win, they can contest. So the idea is that voters would have to come out in all this constituency to give Amno the best chance. Right. Right? And also PH voters will come out to give PH the best run. If they find a way of campaigning without toxically attacking each other. That it's a win-win kind of situation, right? Friendly matches. Right. So then it's not easy because you now have to say, I'm better than a worthy opponent. How? Mm. You have to find a way, right? You have to set rules. But once that works out, both sides can actually get more voters going. Right. We have to win. So you have to come out towards. But that would spill over to area where they don't fight against each other. Right. Wow. Right? So that's one. Uh, second way is to open up more electoral arena. You have two options. One option is to have party lists, what I talk about now. So for example, as Islam, we have 22 seats. We add 11 seats on party lists. Mm -hmm. Then both PH and BN can nominate 11 candidates. And PN, of course, will come in as well. Mm. And then, when you did second votes, both sides just vote for them. So, AMNO supporters who either stay back at home because they cannot carry themselves to vote AMNO as PH number two, or even move over the other side because they really don't like PH to be AMNO boss, can now come in and vote. Right. And when they vote for AMNO, they will start thinking and say, I'm no main enemies, main rivals is Pesatu and Pass. Right. Right? Why should I help them? Because that would weaken them. Yes. That's one way. Second way is to open up local elections. I don't need that. Because if PH states were to start first, allowing local elections, Amno would have a chance to win some Correct. local council right. seat. And why this is important? This allow Amno to continue acting attracting young talents. Mm -hmm. Because if I join a party that never have a chance to win seats, I won't join. Right. That's why MCA lost talents to, you know, has, uh, not lost, suffer uh, lack of talents after 2008. Right. So I'm not need because to Because they just this. lost them. I mean, you know, they just left. When, when you don't have a chance to win, Correct. why would I join well, a party? Absolutely. Right? I mean, so they have to go into that. Now, when it is open up in PA states, once it works out, the Malays don't fear about local elections. Amno can push for and say, we're going to do it in Pahang, in Johor, in Malacca, but we're also pushing you to open up pass. Okay. Right? That allowed Amno to get seats. Most of all is that Amno need to get some seats in the north. If you have party list, Amno will be able to get some seats in the north. Right, right. Right? right. Because in Kelantan, in Tengganu, yeah, they so still have about to it, the, around 30% of votes, sure, sure. they just cannot win any seats under first possible. Correct. You need to give them the chance. So Amno need to be able to survive after elections. They can come back and form a coalition again. Right. Excellent. Well, you know, if I had a political party, you would be my strategist. <laughs> because at the end of the day, you want the country to win. Yes. Uh, that is the bottom line. Uh, yes. All of us want a win-win situation where you know there's peace and harmony and so um, my, my our closing segment is something that's very recent uh, where we want to keep the government and give it its full run yeah. for four years which is a fixed party mm. a fixed uh, term parliament act yeah. uh, we want to see i want to hear your views on that and perhaps that would give a, a good f a roundup of where we are in this country today so 
You'll join us soon. So in closing, Professor Dr. Wong Chin Huat, uh, it's been an honor to have you with us and hard talk. And, uh, and I want to end with this current situation now that we're talking about what's called a fixed term parliament act mm. of how we can keep this coalition that we talked about in this whole discussion going on for the next four years where they have a full run of reformation, bringing up reforms that matter to the country, being able to finish the term because we have seen so much of changes going on. Mm. and uh, which can, can put off the, the, the public, you know, of trust and uh, having some form of loyalty of thought. Um, what is your take on it? I have been a long proponent for a fixed-term parliament, uh, going back at least by, say, uh, late 2021. Oh, really? Uh -huh. Yeah. And you think this is a, a good thing? It's a good thing because I don't believe in political adventurism. I don't buy this idea that Prime Minister should have the free hand to call election any time he or she wants uh, to get the best election outcome. And not just about that this is unfair to the opposition. My main concern is that if you allow politicians to manipulate on the timing of election to dictate uh, the electoral calendar, it affects the qualities of policy. Right. Because then they can calculate and say which is when I want it. The policy become much more short term uh, orientated, uh, maybe risky and so on. So for me, fixed term parliament uh, is superior, it's a superior tool because it disables political adventurism in this way. Right. So that's something that why I like because I think even, uh, of course, having said that, we do not, when we talk about fixed term, we do not rule out the fundamental mechanism that the parliament must have the power to overthrow the government. Right. So when we talk about fixed term parliament, we are not talking about fixed term government. Right. Right. What it means is that you have the same parliament, but you may actually have midterm change in government. So this is what a lot of people who want stability, who may not actually get it correct, including some politicians in the government. Right. They were thinking that, say, you're going to have a law that's going to keep this government there. I would say, no, it doesn't do it directly. It does it by limiting the avenues to change government, forcing it to happen only in Devon Rakyat, right. which I go in later. But second, also you create this expectation that when election is likely to be held. Right. And therefore, people would make their plan, whether for work, for voting, for organizing event, whatsoever thing. You set your calendar knowing what would Where, happen yeah, next, right? right? So that's once good. you set it in, you would hate anyone who disrupt your agenda. Correct. Right? So when the opposition try to bring down false and early election, they likely get punished. This is where you actually help. But it doesn't protect the government directly. Right. Now, what we need to look at now is that, let, let me explain in full what do we mean, a fixed term parliament act. It means that it's a simple but powerful idea that a, government, a parliament should serve its full term. So Malaysia, five years. Mm. Unless one of these two extraordinary circumstances happens, one, the government lost its majority in the House. Mm. So instead of telling the Prime Minister must resign, the Prime Minister must have that chance to say, I won an election. Mm -hmm. And then let the King decide whether to give that royal consent or before it. Second, for whatever reason, if two-thirds of the parliamentarians pass a resolution for an early election, then you can go ahead. So what we are talking about here is certainly not some criticism laid by what I call semi-expert. Right. People appoint themselves to comment on this without looking at actually the nuances, the facts, and so on. Yes. One thing they like to say, oh, this is going to prolong or prop up a weak or unpopular government. That's not true. 
Right. Because what we are saying is that it, the law should actually define what constitutes a loss of confidence and limit it to the passing of uh, a word of no conf a motion of no confidence, the defeat of emotions of confidence, a defeat of budget in mm -hmm. second or third reading. Now, once you put all this, you would have to amend your standing order in Dewan Rakyat. Okay. So to prioritize this, then a prime minister cannot use the speaker to block motions of no confidence uh, or confidence. They have to do this. What is really taken out is a QSD, statutory declaration. Uh, and why this is important? Look at the situation now. We, people talk about London move, Jakarta move, yes. and then Dubai move. All this move is basically based on some numbers. No different from what Anwar say on, uh, in September 2021, just before the uh, four days before polling of the Sabah state election. Mm. He said, I have, have a strong, yes, yes. convincing and formidable majority. Correct. Right, but he never delivered it. Why? Because you have MPs who are happy to sign on the SD so that if you get, into, get to become prime minister, they're kingmakers. They expect you to pay back. Right. But they don't have to show their face. So if you feel, they lose nothing. Yes. Right. But you're going to, if you can force it to happen in the Dewan Rakyat, they have to show their face. Mm. Right. And I see that as a right for them to do so. You just have to deal with it. Right. And so the QSD is what makes it particularly important now. Mm. And for those people who say this is undemocratic, wrong. We actually just want it to happen in the House. How can this be undemocratic? Then there's an argument saying that, oh, the Prime Minister cannot, cannot uh, seek an early election now. No, he can. He or she can. He or she just need to get a tutored support. In other words, the power to seek a royal consent for an early election is no longer monopolized by him. Right. Because he still has needs to be to get... shared with other MPs. Yeah. Now, tell me, how can a power to be shared by 148 MPs be less democratic? than the power in the hand of one, one man person. or one woman. Absolutely. Right? So these are the checks and the... Yes, exactly. Know, so we are actually getting a system to be less majoritarian. But I know many Malaysians love majoritarianism because they have not lived in another country, in another system. They probably didn't bother to read about this. Right? But ignorance is not the reason why we reject reform. Yep. If I, I welcome the debates. I think... Uh, we need to see more people laying down the question because there are still uh, details that need to be debated and right. finalized. But we need informed criticism. So the third thing that I want to raise is about what people say, this would take away the king's power. No. In UK, it does take away the king's powers because they want to make it such a situation because first of all, the UK has no written constitution, and more importantly, the British monarch has not made any political decision since 1834. Right. So you don't have a situations where uh, he steps the, in and the, 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 the king, the queen is going to withhold her consent. Right. Right. And so in this case, for the UK, they basically just make it in such a situation, rule out all uncertainty that. If you're going to have uh, the two situations, to, you, you meet one of these two conditions, loss of confidence, two-third support, then election can be called. Right. Right. But in Malaysia, we make it very clear. What we are adding here is one extra layer of safeguard. Because now, the Prime Minister can seek the royal consent for early dissolution. Whether he got away or not, it's only we, we leave it to the king consent as a safeguard. Now, if you're going to add in two-thirds support from the majority, from the House, this is the second layer, right? right. And neither of these uh, safeguards should be considered as undemocratic. Right. Because if the king can say no, you don't say it's undemocratic, why should this be undemocratic when 
MP share the power of the Prime yeah, Minister. Absolutely. Right? And some people say it has few in UK, so it would few in Malaysia. Why should we have it? Let me answer that. In UK, the bill was circumvented and then uh, suspended in 2019 because Prime Minister Boris Johnson passed another bill with a simple majority that's to suspend this Fixed Term Parliamentary Act, which contained a two third threshold. Oh, okay. So basically, you set a threshold very high there. Yeah. It's fine. I use the roundabout way to kill you off. Right, right, right? right. So, what we're going to do to make it work is that in Malaysian uh, version, you must have a clause to prevent any amendment or suspension of the act during the with a, without a true third threshold. Oh, okay. So, you want to suspend it, you can. Get a true third threshold, suspend the bill. Right. Right? Okay. But you don't get a threshold. Then you have to you have to say so it's actually working and why this is important if we have this at the federal level we can actually have it across the country on the state level then you don't have to deal with all this rumor when when Hajiji is going to call for elections or not yes why can't we let our elected representative and the government just to continue their work all the way until five years absolutely uh, on that note of uh, you know a very warm and heartening uh, discussion on where we are, and I want to just say this and end with this, uh, Chin Wat. Hope is the currency of the future in the present. Blind hope is willful ignorance of our past. And what you have really done for us is to take us through the past, lessons learned from the past. How do we move forward into the future with the wisdom that? qualifies us to be a country that will be well developed and where people can live in harmony, tolerance and most of all enjoy this diversity in strength uh, so that we ultimately become winners and, uh, and we can dream again. The Malaysian dream is still alive and, and we have a wonderful country to celebrate. So on that note, once again, Chin Wat, thank you very much for joining us on Hard Talk. Thank you.